what is nitric oxide's role in high blood pressure? Well, we all have a finite volume of blood, right, that our heart pumps through these blood vessels every day. It's a known volume, five to six liters, depending upon your body mass. But we also have a finite number of blood vessels. So if your body can make sufficient nitric oxide, then we can dilate those blood vessels. So now you've got bigger pipes with that same volume of blood pumping through. So it's lower pressure. Now, if you lose the ability to produce nitric oxide, you can't vasodilate. So now you're chronically vasoconstricted. Now you've got that same volume of blood going through smaller pipes, and that's an increase in pressure. And so what that means is when you have constricted, stiff blood vessels, now with each beat of the heart, that pulse wave travels really quickly down the vascular bed, down the vascular tree, and it causes damage. It causes sheer stress on our endothelial cells, damages the endothelium, and then, you know, things, damages that barrier function. And if our body can make nitric oxide, the blood vessels are dilated, but they more, more importantly, they become soft and compliant. So they dampen that pulse wave with each heartbeat. And you can do this through augmentation pressures and look at kind of the reflective wave with each heartbeat. Um, but in terms of blood pressure, it's really the, just the loss of the vasodilation due to nitric oxide. And so we're finding that it's that the oral bacteria are responsible for the vasodilation of systemic blood vessels or resistance arteries that are responsible for maintaining normal blood pressure. Mm. And that was a completely kind of a change in paradigm too, because people thought, how did the oral bacteria, how are the oral bacteria affecting the second to second production and regulation of blood flow and blood pressure in the resistance arteries? And what we're finding is it's nitric oxide being produced. We swallow our saliva. It's transported at s nitrosoglutathione and it's vasoactive so it can dilate those blood vessels along the entire vascular tree. Wow. The body is truly a fascinating miracle. Well, it's like the hip bones connected to the knee bone. <laughs> that <old> story, right? <laughs> the mouth is connected to the blood vessels. I mean, it makes perfect sense to me. But, you know, it also explains resistant hypertension, the oral bacteria. Because if you go to your doctor and you have high blood pressure, he's going to put you on a prescription medication. And if all you have to do is look at the American Heart Association, any uh, agency that keeps track of statistics. 50% of the people that are given a prescription drug for hypertension don't respond with better blood pressure. And in fact, 50% of the people that are given any type of blood pressure don't have their blood pressure managed. And so why is that? Well, there's a certain class of antihypertensives. There's what's called ACE inhibitors, which inhibit the conversion of, <clears throat> of an angiotensin converting enzyme. There's ARBs, angiotensin receptor blockers. So there's a working on kind of the kidney aspect of the regulation of blood flow. It's called the renin-angiotensin system. And then there's things like calcium channel antagonists, which, which modulate the amount of calcium being released in the lining of the blood vessel, and it can dilate blood vessels. And then there are things like diuretics that basically just excrete a lot of fluid from the body, and you basically decrease the volume and volume overload. Or there are things like beta blockers that just base, that pace the, the, the beat of the heart or the rate of the heartbeat so then you don't have the heart pumping as often, so there's decreased pressure. But again, even with those four main class of antihypertensives, 50% of the people don't respond with better blood pressure. And now what we're finding, we published this in 2019, I believe it was five years ago, that the hypertension is a symptom of oral dysbiosis. Mm. So now when you ask your patients, are you using mouthwash? Do you have fluoride in your toothpaste? And two out of three people are going to say yes to the mouthwash, and 10 out of 10 people are going to say yes to fluoride. So then you go, okay, stop using fluoride in your toothpaste, get rid of the mouthwash, come back 30 days, let's look at your blood pressure. And remarkably, the blood pressure normalizes. That quick. It could change in some patients that quickly. Yeah, in our study, we, we found that it completely reversed. So we would give mouthwash twice a day for seven days, stop for four days, bring them back and see, see what the changes were, not only in their, their oral microbiome, but in their blood pressure. So seven days of mouthwash, we saw at worst a 26 millimeter increase in blood pressure. Just seven days of mouthwash use. We didn't change their diet. We didn't change their, these people weren't medicated, but we could make people clinically hypertensive in one week by giving them mouthwash. Crazy. But then, you know, you said the body's so resilient and I was a little bit surprised at this. Four days after we stopped the mouthwash, their oral microbiome had completely repopulated and their blood pressure completely normalized. 
<laughs> so it's kind of like smoking. You know, if you've been smoking for years and you stop, you know, you, you can almost see the benefits within a couple of days. I mean, there's going to be some chronic uh, kind of damage that's t- going to take years to overcome. But with mouthwash and the, the ecology of the microbiome, if you just stop after four days, they completely repopulate, produce nitric oxide, and your blood pressure becomes better normalized. Do you think that, uh, so step one, obviously get off a mouthwash, right? Step two, if you can, which most people can, it's going to be cheaper than also bottled water. It's going to protect you from a lot of things <laughs> like PFAs in the water. Get a high quality filter for the home so you're not drinking water that's uh, blasted with fluoride. Well, right? municipal water is very dangerous. I mean, municipal water is nasty water. In fact, I encourage everybody to get a home filtration system because... You know, it's recycled. There's drug metabolites in there that are small molecules that basically pass through any filtration uh, that's put through municipal water plus municipal pipes in many conditions. I mean, the Flint, Michigan story from years ago. I mean, the pipes in many of these municipalities are decades, you know, years old Yeah, that are corroded. And so we're getting exposed to a lot of these. And I have a personal experience with this. My dad lives in a small town in Lexington, Texas, and the water quality there is horrible and it, it was making him sick and nobody could figure out why he was getting sick. Wow. Until I go, look, there's something in your house that's making you sick. Mm. We did mold testing. We tested everything and I went there and got a drink of water and I go, f- f- what is this? <laughs> I mean, it's not the water you're drinking. It's the water you're cooking in. It's the water you're bathing in. And it's, it's chronic exposed exposure. 24 hours a day. 24 hours a day. And since we did that, we mitigated the water that's 76 years old, a paraplegic, and he's doing great. Wow. What do but you it think? was a medical mystery. We had to go and figure out because every doc and specialist we took him to, put him in the hospital, run tests, run labs, hydrate him. And what I've what finally was the epiphany to me was when he wasn't home, he was well. Mm. And most people, when they go to the hospital, they get sicker. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but dad, when, if, when he left the house, he got better. So then I told me, I go, there's something in his home that's making him sick. Wow. And so we had to dig, 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 and finally it was the water. So get him a filtration system, and the, basically the water over, overwhelmed the fil- filtration system. So then we had to constantly you know, clean the filters and replace the filters, but it's a huge problem. What was going on? Were you able to find any more information out? Was it the degradation of the pipes? Was it, we know in certain places... You know, fracking has contributed to, you know, water quality issues. Uh, it could be if he's in a rural area, pesticides. Were you able to narrow it down in terms of what was getting into the no, water? No, we don't. I mean, this is opening Pandora's box, right? So when you start to interrogate this and, you know, there's enormous liability on the municipality. Yeah. Because it's not just my dad. I mean, how many other people? Dad is just a little bit fragile because of all of his comorbidities and his age. But, you know, there's people that are otherwise healthy that are getting exposed to this that are probably going to... It's going to manifest later in life. But, you know, what they do is they, they test it for the standard testing, right? And so if you don't test for what you what's not in the standard testing, then how do you know? And so all of these things that they sent off for their, for their water supply were within the normal range uh, of what's, re, what's allowed. But yet my question was, what about this, 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 and this? And they go, we don't test for that. Yeah. If you don't test, there's no liability. That's right. Yeah. Well, I'm glad your dad is doing better, at least from that situation. And it's a telling story to remind us all that even if you're not in that position, you still don't want to be contributing to all these risk factors that we have. When we're exposed to really terrible water situation, we're learning more and more that the water in a lot of places is pretty bad. EWG has a website that I think it's called... uh, uh, the clean water map. We'll link to it in the show notes, but you can type in your zip code. I was alarmed to see that here in Los Angeles, they found this, uh, you know, some ra- like radioactive active isotopes in the water in, at some level. They found levels of arsenic and, uh, you know, a whole bunch of other compounds that are there. And now we're finally understanding that there's hundreds of thousands of different types of PFAs, um, PUFAs, PFAs, all these different, you know, forever chemicals there in the water. And even the government itself, they did this big press release and study that was done in a bunch of municipalities. They were saying that in their estimates, 60% to 70% of the water nationwide in America has these forever chemicals in them. When you looked into the study, they're only testing for four forever chemicals. And there's hundreds of thousands of them. 
So in your case of your dad, uh, did you get reverse osmosis? Is there a filter that you recommend to our audience? Sorry to interrupt, but memory loss is on the rise. And that's why I've created a free guide that you can get right now featuring the top brain boosting foods that you can include into your diet starting today to help you combat this. I've worked with a few of my friends to feature five foods in this free guide. And guess what? A couple of them will probably surprise you. Make sure you're one of the people that focuses on keeping your brain sharp by downloading this guide today. Just click on the link below or scan the QR code and I'll send you the guide right away. Yeah, I look, we, I do a lot of investigation. There's, there's several good water companies out there. The one I use is a company called pH prescriptions They're out of Florida. They get a really good reverse osmosis. They replete them with, replete the water with certain nutrients. They charge the water, uh, even make a hydrogen water system. So there's lots of good systems out there. Those are just the ones that I've know and trust. I have a home filtration system in my, uh, my house. I've got a chemical free pool. You know, I have a pool with no chlorine, with no chemicals in it. It's ozonated. Use UV light, and it basically it's a super rich oxygen pool. That's great. So we were on the topic of protecting the oral micro microbiome. Yep. Ditch fluoride. It's always funny when you go to these high end gyms around Los Angeles and any other city too. I think Equinox was doing this back in the day. I don't want to throw them under the bus. I like <laughs> them as a company, but you'd go work out. You go to the you know the men's restroom there. And there's like mouthwash everywhere, right? Because I guess that's what the audience is asking for. But hopefully, knock on wood, if you're at Equinox, you're listening or any other gym that's out there, there's plenty of non-traditional mouthwashes that are out yeah. there that are going to be better for you, that are going to be like xylitol based. Are those okay when it comes to nitric oxide? You know, there's a lot we've learned, but there's still a lot we don't know. Um, we, In fact, just this past weekend, I gave a keynote address at a dental conference in Knoxville, Tennessee. So the dental community is slowly being receptive to this because this was really disruptive to the standard of care in dental medicine because every time you go to the dentist, they go into fluoride rinse. They encourage you to, to use mouthwash so you kill the periodontal bacteria and the gingival bacteria that causes periodontal disease and gingivitis. But now we're recognizing that the collateral damage of the non-pathogenic commensals is much probably much worse than the pathogens that, that uh, you know on the gingival tissue that may be contributing to periodontal disease. Mm. So now what we're trying to do is figure out how do we selectively kill the bad bacteria while maintaining the ecology of the good bacteria. And so, we, you know, I've been working on this for many, many years of trying to figure out how do we develop. Because a lot of people, you know, I still encourage people to brush your teeth. I'm not saying don't brush your teeth, right? Yeah. So how do we create a toothpaste that doesn't have chemi harmful chemicals in it like fluoride, but can actually remineralize the teeth? maintain a healthy microbiome, and give you a fresh breath. So we're working on a toothpaste. We've just, I think, got our final prototype in, and we're, we're making a, a mouth rinse. Because a lot of people, rightfully so, have halitosis, have bad breath, and it's it's offensive when you when you talk to these people. And it's not their fault. It's their, just their, it's, it's dysbiosis. And so those people feel like they need to use mouthwash. And I think there there may be some reason for that. But again... What's the collateral damage of killing the the stinky bacteria that's causing halitosis without destroying the good bacteria? Right, and how much of halitosis is in the mouth versus in the gut? And well, it's all systemic. Everything that's excreted from the skin or in the mouth or in the breath is is all reflection of systemic health. Yeah. So we we I developed a um, a mouth rinse that appears the early data are coming out that we can selectively kill the pathogens, and we're actually improving the microbiome and the nitric oxide producing bacteria. That's exciting. And so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take our mouthwash and we're going to give it to patients with high blood pressure and see if we can normalize their blood pressure with a mouth rinse. That's great. Because that would be, I think that's a game changer. Well, well, in the meantime, if you're using fluoride toothpaste, we already said ditch the traditional yeah, mouthwash, get rid, of get rid of the fluoride toothpaste. I know a lot of people and dentists that I you know look up to, they'll use like hydroxyapatite, right? Yeah. As one like you know, solution. That it actually remineralizes. I use one called uh, Fig F Y G G. Not affiliated with them. Just a big fan of the company. Uh, it's developed by this guy um, Mark Berhenna, who I think you know. Ask the dentist. He's a really good guy, uh, biological and functional uh, dentist. And uh, and we'll look out for yours in the future when it's ready yeah. as well too. The mouthwash. Uh, 
Clean up your home water by getting a reverse osmosis, re- reverse osmosis, tongue, tw- tongue, tw- tongue tied. <laughs> <laughs> but also that remineralizes the water because yes, you, you need that. Yeah. yeah. You don't want distilled water. You know, that'll- right, right. You can add some minerals in, you can add some electrolytes, you can add some stuff, but yeah, you don't want to be drinking distilled water long term. That's not going to be good for you. And then uh, in addition to, uh, in addition to that, um, how much dysbiosis in the mouth is also in, you know, I know this may not be necessarily your area of expertise, but people might need to go and work with like a biological or a functional dentist and somebody who, you know, helps them also take a look at their diet and talks about the relationship between diet and oral microbiome. YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. Yeah, nitric oxide is considered really the holy grail because it's involved in everything we know about the onset and progression of cardiovascular disease. When you lose the ability to make nitric oxide, that sets the stage for the onset and progression of vascular disease.